So welcome, welcome back. Don't forget to fasten your seatbelts. On the right hand side, we see some office buildings, but also coming now on the right, some apartment buildings. But these are quite Cheers. different uh, from the ones we've uh, previously seen. So uh, they are a bit more special, and uh, people really love them. So they are also quite expensive. Uh, now, housing in uh, Bergen, um, the prices for real estate uh, varies quite uh, much, quite a lot from location to location. Uh, but I would say the prices start somewhere around uh, 4 million uh, kroners and can go up to 10, 20, depending. So an apartment here, I would say it's around 7, 8 million kroners, but I don't know for sure because I haven't checked the real estate. So 10 kroners is $1 more or less, just to have an idea. But in Norway, generally people prefer uh, buying than uh, renting. Uh, so whenever uh, a couple wants to um, buy a, an apartment, they can go to the bank and it's quite uh, easy to get a loan, especially if you are two and if you have a steady income, then the bank will immediately grant you uh, quite a good loan. So a lot of people do that. And Norway uh, is a very wealthy country. Um, that's um, partially because of the oil and gas industry, but also because of the way the government uh, handled the, the large inflow flow of, of wealth and money. Because a lot of the countries that uh, have oil and gas are on the opposite pole. They are rather poor and have a lot of social issues. But that's also because the government is corrupt and uh, is not democratic at all. And there's usually one person or group of people who get very rich, who are in power. Um, politicians who make promises of, oh, we'll have, we have so much money, we'll spend it. But it's not uh, founded uh, on a stable economy. So then the economy fall, comes crashing down. But that didn't happen in Norway, where the government was um, very uh, careful to not uh, spend this money uh, needlessly so and also from the beginning to avoid having too many foreign companies um, drilling and having the oil rights and therefore taking the money and the wealth from the country so when the oil and gas was discovered in the north sea in 1969 uh, norwegian government let uh, phillips uh, help with the drilling with the promise that the Norwegians will learn to do it by themselves and after a few years they will not need any foreign interventions. And that all these foreign uh, drilling companies, they cannot take all the revenues from the oil and gas. This has to stay for the people. And then in the 90s the oil fund was created where the money is saved, but not just saved, also invested in different uh, um, departments and, and in different industries around the world. Uh, so in case of an economical collapse, Norway will still have reserves and something to rely on because with oil and gas, Norway basically has all, all its eggs in one basket because there isn't much other industry in Norway. Uh, the second largest, um, which is uh, um, something that can be quite sustainable and for a long run because oil and gas will eventually uh, will run out of it, uh, is hydropower uh, energy. So. That's why uh, Norway uh, relies a lot of, on electricity, uh, sells all the oil and gas, or almost all of it, and uh, it is the use electricity for the everyday life. We use electricity to heat up the houses. You can see around you all these wooden neighborhoods. Uh, they don't have any, um, any gas pipelines, so there is no gas coming in the houses, which is very good. <laughs> something would happen, the whole neighborhood would be just burned out. Um, so cooking is done with, uh, with uh, electricity as, uh, as well. And nowadays, of course, even more often, uh, people driving electric. And uh, uh, hydropower energy comes from the rivers and the lakes up in the mountains. Uh, we don't complain, therefore, about the, the weather and the rain, because all that water uh, supplies us with very good, um, gives, um, gives a lot of um, possibility for hydro energy. And that is a uh, very good thing. Also, the third uh, largest industry 
is aquaculture or fish farming industry and uh, it's growing more the numbers of uh, um, tons of fish exported every year so Norway uh, raises in these fish farms that are, can be found along the West Norwegian coast salmon and trout uh, but mostly the salmon is popular um, and at the moment Norway exports about 1.5 million tons of salmon each year uh, to different countries around the world but especially Japan has always been a very avid customer because they can use it to make sushi out of it. Um, you see if you make uh, sushi out of wild salmon uh, you might get sick because they have a lot of parasites so you need to use very clean fish uh, to make to, yeah, to eat it raw. Uh, so the farmed salmon is guaranteed to be uh, parasite free. Um, there are a lot of controversies about fish farming, of course, uh, but one thing is that uh, the Norwegian government is very heavily involved in making this industry as clean as and sustainable as possible. Uh, there are no, um, there is no perfect way of doing that. But one of the things that the Norwegian government really is really adamant about is um, the use of the antibiotics. So no antibiotics are used in the feed. Uh, all fish are vaccinated and that keeps them quite healthy. Now on the left hand side we can see a very interesting building. It's quite long isn't it? This is actually an old rope factory or a rope walk it's also called and it's not used anymore but it's kept for nostalgic purposes reminding of uh, the times when uh, Bergen was a hot and boat building uh, industries that are very closely connected so ropes were made in such long buildings because they had to be kept dry you couldn't make them outdoors not in a city like Bergen I continue on the right hand side you can see the Mount Ulrikan and the cable car as well the Ulrikan cable car that goes up to 630 meters the mountain itself is 643 meters uh, so rope uh, had to be twisted and kept under tension the whole time and uh, while you are making the rope uh, factory was the more rope you could produce and you can see a charging station here on the right hand side for the electrical cars and I don't know if you've noticed but our bus is also electric so now are popular so now even buses are electric and um, yes about the rope factories uh, so they um, used a different type of fibers that were usually imported because you can't grow so much uh, plants for fibers in, in Norway and hemp came for example often from Russia um, but also cocoa fig and from Caribbean so different fibers that came from different parts of the world were used in the Norwegian tex uh, not textile but rope industry but there is one uh, traditional um, fiber that even the Viking used and it could be found local and that is linden tree bark so the linden tree is a very common tree in Norway uh, you can often see it uh, just growing on the sidewalk on the, on the side of the street and sometimes you see in Bergen these sort of knobbly trees um, they look very strange they have been heavily pruned uh, in order to prevent the roots from growing too much out of the asphalt or of the pavement um, but they are the same trees uh, that also produce the sweet scented flower I don't know if you've ever tried linden tree tea it's very soothing um, I know that in, um, in um, other uh, other ways of calling this tree is also lime wood or basswood so if you don't know exactly what linden trees maybe basswood sounds more familiar uh, this is the um, uh, Bergen Central bus station on the right hand side so what they, they did they would carve out the, the, the trunk sorry the, um, the bark from the tree trunk and they would tie it in bundles and emerge it in seawater for several months 
and this would get soaked in the water. Bark was very soft and flexible, but more importantly, the, the fibers would easily tear off. Then you would just have to leave it to dry a little bit more. And then, just like with any other fibers, you would just uh, tie it together and twist it and turn it, creating very strong and durable rope that uh, was also naturally waterproof and would last you almost a lifetime. In fact, when they unearthed these Viking ships that were bur uh, buried with their chieftains, they would often find also pieces of linden tree rope that was still in really good condition. <coughs> now on the left-hand side, you can see uh, again the Greek Hallen, so the concert hall, and the rhododendrons in blossom. Now it's really the time of the year where the city sort of uh, explodes in a symphony of colors because of all the different rhododendrons growing just basically wildly everywhere. So Bergen is also coined as the city of the rhododendrons. And um, they grow here so well because of the mild climate. You see Bergen's climate is, uh, and, on, and the entire West Norwegian coast is influenced by the Gulf Stream from the Caribbean. On the right hand side, all the building alongside the way, uh, they are art galleries belonging to the art museum uh, Kude, and they feature uh, works of art of Norwegian, but also uh, international painters. But from the Norwegian ones, I would definitely mention Edvard Munch, who painted the Scream, which is actually exhibited in Oslo. Johan Christian Dahl, who managed to capture the magnificent landscapes of Norway. Nikolai Astrup, Erik Wedenschold, and so on. On the right hand side we have the city square called the festivity square as a celebration for the 17th of May start here. We have the artificial lake which used to be part of the city fjord with the fountain and the sakura trees, a gift from Japan, uh, blossoming all over the square. On the left hand side we have the music pavilion, a gift from Consul Georgade, the same guy who saved Pant of Stave Church. And there's always flowers around it. Now the flowers are in the colors of the Norwegian flag. Uh, on the left hand side, the statue of Edvard Grieg, and on the right hand side, the statue of Christian Mikkelsen, the Prime Minister of Norway of 1905, when Norway uh, was uh, uh, declared independent from the long 19th century. The 17th of May is a very important day, I'll tell you in a moment why. But on the right hand side, we have the um, old fire station and we have the old city hall here to the right this white building with the golden c7 the monogram of the danish norwegian king christian VII. as we are now approaching the city center we can see two of the main shopping malls exhibition and galleria but they are closed on sunday um uh, for 17th of may 1814 norway wrote and signed its first norwegian constitution which was uh, influenced uh, and based on the American Constitution and on the right of the people to decide on the affairs of the country. It was the, 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 the founding stone for democracy and it enabled also the dissolution of the union between Norway and Sweden. Therefore, it's celebrated with great, um, with great color. On the left hand side, you can see the sailor's uh, monument and the broad walking boulevard Torgalmeningen. Uh, the Seafarers Monument pays homage to all the sailors from the Viking time to the more modern days. And then we also have the statue of Ludwig Holberg on the right hand side, very famous Danish Norwegian playwright uh, who was actually originally from Bergen, but he lived most of his life in Copenhagen because that was during the union with Denmark and Copenhagen was the capital. So we are now slowly driving to the lower station of the cable car, the funicular Floybanen. So from here, walking to the Bruggen and the Schötztöne. So you just pick us up um, from Schötztöne. Twelve forty-five. Twelve forty-five. Yeah. In Devregen. 